Hi, everyone. Old friends, new friends. I saw some familiar names. And as you can see, we have guest Lisa C on the screen with us. And I'm Zhang Mei. I'm founder of Wild China. Welcome to uh, our 84th event. I, when we started this a year ago, a year and a half ago, we did not think we would count to these numbers. We thought the pandemic would be over, everybody would be traveling, but very sorry, we are still Zooming and <laughs> we'll continue. Um, in any event, this is our monthly book club. Um, some of you may have joined our, uh, our previous book clubs and this month we read this book. Snowflower and the Secret Fan um, by Lisa C. And this is actually our second uh, book club event with Lisa. Uh, last year we read the, the, the Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, and that was set in my home province of Yunnan, which I loved. Um, and if you're interested in catching up with our book club events, you can find all the past recordings on our YouTube channel. It's called While Trying to Travel. And um, so, this book today, if you haven't read the book, get the book, or there's a, also a movie of the same name, and uh, there are many options. It's quite interesting, and oh, I want to know what Lisa thinks about the movie later on as well. But before we start, let me uh, just say a few words about our guest. Lisa C. is the New York Times best-selling author of several, several books. We mentioned the tea girl of Hummingbird Lane, Island, sea, uh, Island of Sea Women, this one, Peony in Love, and Shanghai Girls, China Dolls, and Dreams of Joy, which debuted at number one. She's also the author of On, On Gold Mountain, which tells the story of her Chinese-American family's settlement in Los Angeles. And in addition to her historical fiction novels, Lisa has also written a mystery series that takes place in China as well. Her books have been published in 39 languages around the world, and she has received the Golden Spike Award from the Chinese Historical Association of Southern California and the History Makers Award from the Chinese American Museum. Lisa was also named National Women of the Year by the Organization of Chinese American Women. So please join us in thanking Lisa for taking the time to be with us again. It's an honor to have you. And uh, logistics, we will have uh, about 15 to 20 minutes handed over to Lisa to talk about why this book and her journey to this book. And then we'll just kick off with Q and A's. We have a group of questions that were previously submitted, but if you have any questions, just feel free to um, type into the chat box or Q and A box. We'll try to get to them as quickly as we can. So Lisa, I'll hand things over to you and let's talk about the Snowflower and the Secret Fan. Well, thank you for having me back. And this is really wonderful. And thank you for everyone who's joined in uh, tonight, wherever in the world you are. Uh, so yeah, so Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I think the thing to do is sort of cast your minds back in time to the mid 1970s. It's the you know, height of the cultural revolution. And an old woman is traveling by train and she faints in a train station. And people come to help her and they find in her clothing these little pieces of paper with, with what looks like secret code written on them. And of course, this was the height of the Cultural Revolution. Everybody was very suspicious. But nevertheless, you know, so as, as a result, they arrested her thinking that she might be a spy. And so they brought in different cryptologists and different, you know, linguists and people like that to come and look and try to figure out what this was. And again, because it was the Cultural Revolution, all of those people were arrested and then sent out to the countryside. And they didn't come back until the mid 1980s when they once again took up this study of what could this be? And it turned out not to be a secret code um, you know, for spy purposes. It was actually a secret writing system developed by women, used by women for about a thousand years, kept a secret for about a thousand years uh, from the Hunan um, province. And so this just really amazed me. Now, the way I found out about it initially was that I had reviewed a book for the Los Angeles Times on the history of foot binding. 
And in that book was just a three or four page mention of the secret language. And I just became totally obsessed. Again, here was a language invented by women, used by women, kept a secret by women for a thousand years. I mean, a remarkable thing. And I just kept thinking to myself, how could this exist and I didn't know? And then sort of how could this exist and we all didn't know? Because, you know, so often we hear about women in the past. There were no women writers. There were no women artists. There were no women historians. There were no women architects. There were no women chefs. There were no women fill in the blank. But of course there were women who did these things. It's just so often what they did was lost, forgotten, or deliberately covered up. What made this different was it was the women themselves who had kept it a secret. So truly, I became obsessed. And I, whenever I would have free time, I would poke around on the internet to see what I could find. Now, you have to remember, this is more than 20 years ago at this point. And actually, there were two things on the internet, on the entire internet, <laughs> just two things about an issue. And then I lived pretty close to UCLA. I would go over to the research, one of the research libraries there to poke around. And you know, there too, I would find one, two, three things. But whatever I found, instead of calming my obsession, it actually fed my obsession. Until one day I said to my husband, you know, there's only one thing I can do. I have to go to China to see what I can find. And so off I went, and this is a pretty remote county in southwestern Henan province. It's called Jianyang County. And while I was there, you know, I was walking from village to village. Um, I got to interview the, at that time, the oldest living Wushu writer. Her name was Yang Wanying. She was I can't remember 93 or 96 when I interviewed her. She had bound feet. She taught me how to make bound foot shoes. She taught me how to make wedding quilts. She talked about the time before her feet were bound, what it was like to have her feet bound, the importance of this secret language in her life. Um, there were two types of relationships that developed out of this secret language. One was called a sworn sisterhood and the other one was a Lao Tong relationship. Um, so what would happen was you know, in a particular village, all the little girls who were having their feet bound would be brought together. They would go upstairs to what was called the upstairs room um, and they would learn to embroider, they would learn to sew and weave, they would be preparing things for their um, dowries to take into marriage and they would also learn this secret writing. And so these, you know, again, sworn sisterhoods, they'd all come together, you know, several times a week to be together to, to learn the secret language and do these other activities that would make them good wives and mothers. When they turned 15, these girls were married out into neighboring villages. Uh, and once they married out, that sworn sisterhood dissolved. And so that all, and you could never see them, you know, your sworn sisters again. And so all that these women had, and once they married into their husband's homes, they went up into that upstairs woman's chamber and there they basically stayed until they died um, and so all those women had to keep them company to offer comfort for even entertainment were the things that women their sworn sisters had written to them you know from the time they were five to when they had married out the other relationship this lao tong means old thing uh, relationship same, same kind of thing. Little girls are about five years old. Um, they're just having their feet bound. But it's also a time when the match, matchmakers are coming, again, to look for little girls in this village to marry out to little boys in the neighboring villages. And sometimes the matchmaker would come looking for another girl who could match eight characteristics. So two girls who could match eight characteristics, born on the same date, in the same birth order, with the same degree of prettiness or ugliness, with the same size bound foot. Eight things that met, needed to match, obviously very hard to find. But if those two girls could be found, they would go, um, they would be matched in, in this Lao Tong relationship. They'd sign a contract and they too would go up to the upstairs chamber. They'd learn to embroider. They'd work on their 
how learn how to do, you know, write new shoe. But unlike the sworn sisterhood that dissolved at marriage, these girls would also marry out. But through throughout the rest of their lives, they would not only be allowed to write to each other, but they would also be allowed to see each other at certain times during the year. So this was like, um, you know, a best friend relationship, but taken to a really high level <laughs> and, and really kind of codified by having this signed contract. So um, I, when I was working on this, I really thought about three things kind of simultaneously. One really had to do with friendship and, um, you know, we're women, just the two of us here, I'm going to suspect that there are quite a lot, few women watching right now. And, you know, this female friendship is a unique relationship that we have in our lives. Um, we will tell a friend something that we wouldn't tell our husband, our boyfriend, our lover, our mother, our children. It's a very particular kind of intimacy. And of course, whenever you're opening your heart, whenever you are vulnerable, you're also vulnerable to being hurt and being betrayed in some way. And so, uh, you know, when I think about female friendship, and of course, there are lots of books that have, you know, have that as a topic. But whenever I think of female friendship, I think of those sort of dark shadow sides and those dark shadow places. So wherever I see those shadows, that's where I want to go. So the next um, thought I had really had to do with love. And I'm just going to stop here and just say that, you know, after this trip, and, and it was a pretty difficult trip. Um, like I said, it's, it's um, 20 some years ago. Um, China has changed a lot uh, since that time. I flew into Guilin and then it was about a 10 hour drive on dirt roads to get to this, to Jianyang County. Um, you know, they had a hotel, but uh, I had a choice. Either I could be locked in my room or I had to sleep with the door open. And so, you know, I chose to sleep with the door open. I couldn't imagine being locked in. Um, you know, they said there was hot water. I never saw it. We had electricity for an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a more of a camping trip. <laughs> you know, it was a tough trip. And um, on my way back out, I flew back out through Guilin, and I had one night uh, in the Sheridan. So I had, you know, sheets, hot water, room service. Uh, it was really pretty great. And this, this voice kind of came into my head. And really, I, I don't want you to think that I knew from that very first moment when I first read about Nishu in that book on foot binding. Oh, yes, I'm going to write a novel and it's going to, you know, take off in some incredible way. I just had this obsession. But anyway, on my way back out of China, you know, here I am in the Sheraton and I, uh, this voice kind of came into my head and it was a little bit of my grandmother, a little bit of Yang Wanying, the woman I had just interviewed and a little bit of my great aunt. And it was so strong that I um, pulled out my laptop and I wrote what did become the first chapter. And in that first chapter, there is this old woman looking back on her life. And uh, she, one of the things she talks about is that she always longed for love, but she couldn't recognize it even when she had it. So this love really became this sort of second theme that I was thinking about. And you would know this, um, you know, in Chinese, there are very different written characters to describe these different aspects of love that we have in our lives. Um, you know, in English, we have one word that we use and I can say, I love my husband, I do, I love my kids, I do, but I also really love ice cream. You know, I, I love to travel. Um, my husband has said on occasion, you know, I think you love ice cream more than you love me and probably there's some days I do. <laughs> But that we have that one word. But in written Chinese, there are these very different words or characters to express very different aspects of love, gratitude, love, respectful love, pity love. And I can say that and you know exactly what I mean. 
There's also this character for mother love, which is composed of two elements. One part means love, the other part means pain. And um, this idea of this particular written character, um, you know, is not only, um, I mean, the whole novel is an exploration of love really, but for the idea of mother love, this was the first novel that I used that idea. And um, I use, have used it, oh, oh, I mean, I keep coming back to it in my books. Uh, and that journey has actually been sort of a, uh, like an emotional journey for me to think about mother love, uh, this love and pain, you know, in different ways. So in Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I was thinking very much about how a daughter would look at her mother, the person who was binding her feet, literally inflicting you know, incredible physical pain in the name of love. In Peony and Love, I thought, no, this is really about how a mother looks at her children. And I can talk for a long time about that. And then in the um, Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, I saw mother love in terms of that moment when we lose our mothers. You know, all of us will lose our mothers at some point and um, that this kind of ultimate loss and separation, again, love and pain. And then uh, lastly, with, um, with Snowflower and The Secret Fan, I had wanted to write about regret and those things that you do in life where you, you can't somehow fix them or that you need to try to fix them and how you go about that and how you can forgive yourself how you can be forgiven, but also what regret does. And so, you know, as I already said, that starts with an old woman looking back at her life and she has these deep regrets and why she has them and how they're tied into love and friendship. So I think I just want to end with um, just a couple little thoughts. One, um, really has to do with how I think about my work just sort of generally. And there was a, a quote that I found that was written by um, these women writers in the mid 17th century in the Yangtze Delta. These are the women that I wrote about in Peony and Love. And they, you know, here was this area where there were just all these women writers who were being published, more women writers being published in this one area of China than all together in the rest of the world at that time. So just really remarkable. Anyway, they, they had this philosophy, which was or sort of something that inspired them. Why is it that in the past, women's thoughts have been like flowers in the wind, drifting off with the current and vanishing without a trace? And I really feel like with my work, that's what I've been really trying to do is to find these women's voices, find these women's contributions, find these women who were so much a part of history and of the past, who have helped to make us all who we are today. And yet so many of them and so much of what they did has, has vanished, you know, really pretty much vanished. So there's that. And then um, the other thing is that I, I really think that, you know, obviously our lives are so different from women who had bound feet, who lived in isolation, who um, really couldn't get out and about, and that they had found this way through their writing to, in a sense, reach out through this window, the single window of their upstairs chamber, reach across the fields, find other women who would listen to them, who with whom they could share their lives, with whom they could share their emotions. And I, I think that we're still there. You know, we still have that longing ourselves. And that certainly this last year and a half of sort of enforced isolation just reminds us how much we need other people and how much we get from other people and, and how important that sense of connection is and, and what we'll do for it you know, to achieve it. So I think, I think, um, how does that sound? Is, is that a good place to sort of that sounds change, shift the discussion? No, yeah, thank you. I, I think it, it sounds great. And it made me think, as you were referring to the last year and a half, Zoom window is our secret fam right now. Exactly. We are, 
we are reaching across entire globe. Uh, I think I'll participate exactly. all over the place, the desire for human connection. Um, yeah, and don't you think like at the beginning you thought, well, Zoom is sort of a flash in the pan and we'll all get, you know, okay, this was great. You know, it was like the first couple things I did like this, this is great, but it'll never happen again. But I find that, you know, Zoom conversations, Zoom ways to meet with family, but also events like this, that, um, you know, you at, the reach is so broad. I mean, I, have, I haven't looked to see where the participants are today, but, you know, you and I are here in California, I think you're in Northern California, I'm in Southern California, and yet I bet there are people from, you know, many states and many other countries and how remarkable that is. Yeah. But also it really says something about that need we have to connect, that need we have, um, here's someone from Jakarta, you know, that need we have to connect as people, as humans, that this is part of what makes us human. Yes, absolutely. It's, oh my God, help us understand where you are all dialing in from today. Type in the chat box, let's take a look. Wow, uh, Brazil, Philippines, <laughs> Canada. So cool. Arkansas, wow. Austin, this is just great. San Diego, Mendocino. Many in the U in the U.S., but the far flung um, participants. Thank you. It must be at weird hours. Chile, Singapore. This is great, isn't it? Okay. Um, and places I'd really like to go. Like I love Chile. I would love to go back there, but you know, obviously we have a wait. A little bit. Hopefully not too far in the future. Right. Okay. So we have so many questions submitted here. And uh, I, I, I sort of divided them into buckets. One of the area where a lot of people are fascinated was about foot binding. And um, I found, you, you know, because I, many of you know, I grew up in China until my 20s. And so, so the foot binding isn't a novel concept for me. But one thing in your book that you wrote about the difficulty of walking and the actual process of breaking the bones just was mind blowing to me uh, who, who know people who have little feet. Mm -hmm. right? um, I, I just find that quite shocking. But I also wanna share a little bit something personal on this subject is that my grandmother was born in 1919, sadly passed away 18 years ago and she had small feet, but not too small, I would say size four or something like that, because she started finding feet, but 1919, by 1925, China was changing so much that her family actually let sort of her unbound. Feet come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her feet came back. And uh, funny enough, my daughter yesterday was watching the film with me and she was horrified. She said, I am so happy that I don't have to do that. You know, it just shows you the entire journey in four generations, yeah. how much we've gone through, right? So my question is, and some people say some of this sort of generational historical trauma um, stay in the DNA. What do you think, um, even though we don't China, no Chinese women bind feet anymore today, I don't think so. Um, what imprint has left, has that left on us all? Did you well, ever... here's the thing, actually. I, I think we have to remember that um, other cultures do things to the human body. Um, you know, to me, when I think, of, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but the number one age in the United States for breast implants is 17. Really? So, <laughs> you know, 17. It's a very popular high school graduation present. So who's giving that? You know, it's the mother. And why is she giving it? You know, oh, you could say, oh, so her clothes fit better. I see that at that reason a lot. But really, what is the reason? It's to make your daughter more marriageable. And so is that all that different from finding your daughter's feet to make her more marriageable? I mean, I, I so obviously these are very different things. You know, female genital mutilation, uh, in Africa. Why do they do it? To make a girl more marriageable. So 
Mm. I'd like to think we're further along in, you know, from this kind of thing, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know about your question exactly because I don't know how we um, take those kinds of things generationally, but I do, I don't, what, what I would say is I just don't think we're that far removed from it. Wow, wow. Even though on the surface, you know, that the girls yeah. actually in some ways, the, you know, the girls today with the revolution to be able to wear whatever they want, we're still not far from the essence of why. And um, there were some questions here. Yeah, and also, I mean, you know, wear whatever you want. You could wear Zori's flip flops um, or you could wear a shoe with a heel this big, right? And, and you can still be a teenager and do that. And, and you're doing it because you think that looks pretty, that makes me sexy, whatever it is. But, um, you know, I don't think anybody <laughs> would really say, oh, a six inch heel is comfortable. 10, 10 inch. <laughs> Actually, yeah. you sh right before this call, you showed me uh, one of the little, actually, yeah. shoes. Yeah, so here's a shoe I have. And um, it's actually more of an overshoe, like if you were going out in the rain. So you'd actually have your, you know, your foot would actually be, you know, another shoe inside here. But just for sort of perspective, here's my phone. And so you can see sort of the size, you know, smaller than, a, than an iPhone. Um, and yeah, this is a, a homemade. I was just looking in it earlier before we got on the call. You can see all the little, you know, all the little stitches that somebody, you know, made this by hand. Can we see the bottom of it and see yeah. how? So this one has a little heel and um, all this, it, it's almost like quilting stitches on the bottom. You know, it's, it gives, there is a little bit of a sole in here, um, mm -hmm. but the, it's all held together with these little tiny stitches. And then of course, um, you know, all this nice embroidery that someone did, this side's very faded, so you can't mm -hmm. see the little dog and stuff. But. It's, it just looks unreal, looks like a toy. And um, Jeanette Owens submitted a question earlier it's about this subject. Did the men think that binding women's feet would be harder for them to leave or was it just more sexy? So that, you know, that's a great question. And the, there were so many reasons that bound lasted as long as they did, you know, about a thousand years. So first, and, and there is that idea of, oh, she can't run away. But the reasons were far more complex. So first of all, it was an incredible economic status symbol for men. A man could say, I am so wealthy that look, my wife doesn't have to work. Or I am so incredibly wealthy that not only does my wife have bound feet, but even our servants have bound feet. That was a very, very wealthy man. Another thing, I mean, and also economic, I, and I just want to say too, you know, I live in Los Angeles, so you could go walking in Beverly Hills and see a man walking down the street with a wife with a, or a girlfriend with those, you know, big, fake breasts. And what is that? That's a man saying, look what I can afford. I mean, you know, so we're, again, we're not that far removed from it. It's, it's a very LA thing. You it know. is a very LA thing. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, but it is. Um, but anyway, so that's one. But another economic factor was that this meant that women were really confined to the home and even really elite women would do um, embroidery, weaving, um, all of these handicrafts that could be sold. There's a very good book called, um, uh, the, I think it's the Women of the Zhang Family by Susan Mann. And there were, you know, this women group, this family of really elite, well-educated women. Um, and I think it is the 17th, 18th century many of whom made, you know, made, a, created a living, helped their families by all these handicrafts that they did. Um, another reason, you know, men are men. And so there was a whole sexual component to bound feet. Whatever you can imagine they did, they did and more. This is something I actually haven't written about very much because it's just like, for me, <laughs> this is like, I don't, I don't wanna go there. <laughs> So really, like whatever you think they did, just like multiply it 50 times. Um, 
Unbelievable. I think you, you know, this still doesn't explain how it could last so long. This was something that was passed from mother to daughter, generation after generation for a thousand years. And so again, I'm just gonna go back to what I said earlier. This, you know, if a mother could give her daughter a pair of perfectly bound feet, then her daughter could marry into a better family, have a better life. And we have to remember, you know, what were the options for girls in those days? You could be, you could work in the fields. You know, people didn't live too long doing that. Uh, you could be a servant, you could be, um, uh, a concubine, you could be a courtesan, you could be a prostitute, you know, the, these are not great options. No. No. And so, you know, this idea that women, mothers could actually try to improve the, the, the chances of life and, and ease for their daughters. And that, but then the last thing is that women liked their bound feet. And so uh, in China, they used to have in you know, villages and towns, um, the equivalent of beauty contests. And the women would line up like behind a curtain and all you would see was just the three inches of their feet, right? That's all you saw. And mm -hmm. the judges would walk up and down and walk up and then they finally said, you know, here is the most beautiful woman in our village. And the curtain would come down and it might be a woman in her seventies, eighties or nineties. So mm -hmm. here's the thing, bound feet never changed. They didn't gain weight, they didn't get wrinkles, they didn't sag, they stayed exactly as they were by the time, you know, from the end of the two year process to making them. You mm -hmm. know, as a woman of a certain age myself, if I just had one part of my body that would just stay where it was supposed to be. Mm, yeah, you know, I, I want to read this comment from Monica Gomez, uh, Gomez says, when I read the part, I cried and cried since I have a daughter and I will never. I will never be, a, be capable to do anything that hurt her. The one thing here we're talking about is that the mothers in, in China who are binding their feet are doing it out of love. That's right. the most ironic. And, and the, just this idea that you're actually giving your, your daughter a chance, a chance mm -hmm. of not, I mean, no, let's just not forget that it was all arranged marriages. So it's not like these girls had a big choice and or, you know, many options if they ended up in a bad place, you can just see what happens to Snowflower in this, in this novel. But mm -hmm. the other options were not good options, you know? Yeah. And, and it, I, I think about this a lot. I really appreciate that, that Monica's thought because this is something I've thought a lot about. You know, what would I do if this was the only thing that I could do to help my daughter have a, a better life. Yeah, difficult choices. Okay, um, I, I want to move the conversation a little bit along this this Lao Tong relationship. I have to admit, it's the first time I heard it and from reading the book. And so I started Googling it and I realized the entire first page, anything that mentions Lao Tong <laughs> refers to you. And, oh, really? And, yes. <laughs> Yes. It was, well, so it, that shows, you know, how the internet has changed since I first started working on the book. It also shows you single-handedly yeah. brought uh, the the awareness up, uh, big time, right? And uh, we have a couple of questions here from the audience. Abigail has asked, um, "You have such insight into this female relationship in your books. Um, do you find inspirations from your own relationships and uh, somehow weave that into the story?" So here's the thing. I you know, um, I don't have a friend like that. <laughs> no, I don't. But I watched, um, my mother had two best friends from the time they were in seventh grade and literally until the day my mom died. So it was 70 some years. And then my sister has had a best friend since they were both three months old. And so while I have not had that relationship, I, you know, in the case of my mother, I watched it my entire life. And then in the case of my little, my sister, I've watched it her entire life. So I, I've had this kind of, um, you know, view into what that's like and the ups and downs in those moments when you, you know, I mean, I, I think of my mother and her, that was different, it was three friends, 
but how, uh, so Joan, Jackie, and my mother, Carolyn. So there were time, there was a time period when Jackie and my mother didn't talk to Joan for something like 20 years. I mean, it was a long time, but then they all came back together and there was another time when they didn't really talk to Jackie and it was just my mother and Joan, but then they came back together. And, and I, I think sometimes in our lives, we, you know, especially how we move so much now and, you know, change jobs and our lives are so much more mobile. And mm. yet we can come back to, you know, I, I think what I've learned over the years is that you, you know, yes, you may have a falling out, but you can come back to a relationship. So I do have a friend that, that I've had since um, high school. And, mm. you know, there have been periods where she's lived far away and we don't see each other for 10 years. And then we'll get on the phone and it's like no time has passed. And so I do think that there are people in our lives it's almost like that those people, they knew you when you were still in your purest form, mm -hmm. you know, that you hadn't become a doctor and you hadn't become a wife and you hadn't become, you know, a dental hygienist, you know, whatever it is, you hadn't become an artist, you hadn't become. And so it, these are people who knew you when you were just purely yourself. And there's something that you can have these long periods of separation. And then when you come back together, it's like you meet on that pure, that pure self level that all the other stuff doesn't really matter. All mm -hmm. the other labels that we have, it's like you can connect in this very direct, very emotional way. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I can relate to that. There are just some old friends, no matter how many years, decades, you haven't seen each other and you see each other within 10 minutes, yeah. you're laughing at the same jokes again. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, uh, there were actually Evelet Weinstein, uh, Marie France. I think they all had similar question. Here, oh, there's a, one that's a different angle from uh, Kelly uh, Venegas. I, I have to completely apologize if I'm butchering all the names. Uh, the question is, what was your inspiration slash motivation for writing the moment? when the two girls, they were still pretty innocent. Maybe they had that intimate scene of touching and writing new show. What were you trying so to explain? To me, that scene is completely about still the language, you know, and, and the intimacy of the language. Now, I get this question a lot about that scene and like, what does it mean? And so here's the thing. I, I don't know what they were doing when I wasn't looking you know, for sure. I don't know what they were doing when I wasn't looking, but uh, to me, these girls are so innocent. They haven't even been outside. You know, they haven't even seen, I don't know, dogs together. You know, they just, ha they're just so really innocent ab about all that stuff. So that to me, it's really about the intimacy of the language and, and the intimacy of, the, of just literally like the words. Um, again, that said, I, I do think that Lily has a kind of male possessiveness when it comes to Snowflower. And um, the last thing I would say about this, because I, you know, I do get a, a lot of questions about that scene and what does that say? And we're, you know, were these women lesbians? And and was that common in China? And actually, I'm just um, during the pandemic. One of the things I've been doing is rereading the story of the stone, you know, Dream of the Red Chamber. And I've been following along, reading it with a podcast called Rereading the Stone. And just this afternoon, I, you know, listened to the, the one that is related to chapter nine, where, you know, there are these boys who are more than a little friendly with each other. And mm -hmm. sort of, you know, so the whole podcast was sort of putting that into a larger context. And what I would say here with this book is that, um, you know, this language of Nushu is very emotionally heightened. And uh, you would think just purely from the language that's used that these women were again, more than just friends. But if you think mm -hmm. of the exact same time period in Europe, you know, in France, in England, but also 
um, in the United States, particularly in New England, you know, women didn't get out. It wasn't like it is today. You couldn't just go and be with a friend. So there was this incredible, um, you know, the way women would communicate, the way they would be together was through writing. And so what you see again in England and New England and France and, um, and you know, throughout Europe really, is these letters that have, again, this really heightened emotionalism to them. And mm -hmm. scholars look at those and say, hmm, were these women more than just friends? And I think what all the scholarship has pointed to is that it's basically at about the same level as it is today. It's just somewhere around 10% of women, you know, were having romantic relationships. But really, this was just about having a an emotional connection through words, through writing. Mm, mm, very interesting. Um, and and uh, I'll just want, and just one other thing about that, you know, and it, here in the West, you know, marriage in that same, again, same time period that I'm writing about in the Snowflower and the Secret Fan, it wasn't like it is today. You know, women were still very isolated, a lot of arranged marriages. Um, you didn't have the same kinds of conversations with your husband that we you know, might have, or your, your loved one that we might have today. Of, you know, who are we gonna vote for? How are we gonna pay the taxes? What are we gonna do about the rent? Um, you know, <laughs> what about that mask mandate? You know, what, you know, the kinds of, Johnny got in trouble in school, what are we gonna do? They, people just didn't, husbands and wives just didn't have that kind of communication. Because it was they these were still you know whether you were in China or you were here it was these very separate realms of living, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that marriages didn't have that same kind of emotional connection that we expect today of our primary love relationships because they weren't necessarily based on love you know they were based on economic viability, our farm is next to your farm, you know, all of these other things that, that, um, so anyway, this writing was a way, whether again, whether it was here or in China or in England, it was a way for women to express their emotions mm -hmm. and, and to share their emotions and have these almost like emotional marriages, you know, when, when actual marriage had very little of, of, emotion in them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was gonna, <laughs> I think that the conversation topics you picked are almost love busters rather than like <laughs> engaging conversations between husband and wife. Um, uh, anyway, uh, one thing I wanted to uh, add is, is that in Chinese language, like you were talking about love and there are, I love my husband versus I love ice cream in different words, yes, we're very specific. But in the culture, there is this fundamental, I, I don't know it's, it's, it, whether it's a shyness or it's a cultural refrain, right. uh, love is not used. And for gay, lesbian, these we, we never had a language uh, to describe them. We don't have the words for them. We, we didn't have Although that. in that lesson today, you know, in the rereading the stone episode today, yeah. he, they actually were talking quite a bit about the language. I mean, I could just reach over to my notes over there because I actually wrote one of them and it was, it was, it was a phrase and it's interesting because it's, it's a word like Lao Tong, um, but it, it was means something like blood brothers, but blood brothers is also a word, you know, in that time that was used for the younger uh, male in a gay relationship. So there were words, but I think that they were, you know, maybe not everybody really understood the, the, the sort of subtext of them. Yeah, the, and, and, and to me, I would think of this Lao Tong being a little bit vague in that not defining a clear border, whether this is a physical relationship or just emotional support relationship, right? Okay, so on the same subject, Stephanie Pham actually specifically asked, why did you choose this particular time period and setting? Um, is, it, is it about the relevance of today? And in fact, what we can learn from unknown history? In fact, that brings me to the movie, right? The movie had 
another part of the story that brought a similar relationship to the modern days. Why did you choose that? So specific? yeah, so I could have said it any time over a thousand years, right? I could have said it when it was invented. I could have said it in the cultural revolution and right. used that old woman who was found in the train as you know, in the train yeah. station as kind of the jumping off point. But one of the things I found, so there, there isn't a lot of old Nushu that has survived. And the reason it, you know, is that typically what would happen was when a woman died, her family and friends would come together and they would take all of her writing and burn it so that it would travel to the afterworld where it would be an introduction of her to everybody else who's there, but also that those words were, would keep her company. Mm -hmm. And so that's one reason. So, you know, a lot of it was burned purposefully, but then um, Sino-Japanese war, a lot was destroyed in that time period. And then of course, during the cultural revolution, so much was destroyed. Mm -hmm. And, um, so not a lot has survived of the old Nushu, but one of the pieces that did survive was written by a woman who uh, lived you know, in this area in Jianyong County who lived through the Taiping Rebellion. So remember earlier how I was saying, you know, no women historians, this is the only piece of writing that has survived that talks about the history of what happened in that, in that county during the Taiping Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And she described, I mean, and I, and I just, I knew when I read this piece um, and what they went through that, you know, how she talks about the women going up the hill, you know, hiking up a mountain in three inch feet. I mean, just think about that. And then living outdoors in the mountains, in the snow, um, and then finally coming down the mountain and so more women died coming down the mountain than had died going up because, you know, no balance, you know, they're just gravity pulling them off as they're trying to walk down this cliffside. And mm -hmm. so I knew when I read that, I knew that no matter what, I wanted to have that in the story. Um, and so everything really, you know, was like, I didn't know where it was going to fit in but that I knew that I wanted to use that. And it was more important to me than, you know, how Nushu came about originally or the, the old woman in the station or anything else. To me, being able to use the type, the material about the Taiping Rebellion sort of trumped everything. Mm, yeah, so that th there's the motion there, um, a dramatic motion, yeah. Okay, thank you. I wanna move the conversation towards the writing process. There were quite a few questions there and specifically on this book. And you mentioned after your conversation with the lady who, who showed you her bounty, you wrote the first chapter. How formed, how, how formed were the characters, Lily and Snowflower? Uh, so what's incredible to me about that first four pages is that whatever the, and I, I truly had not been thinking about a book. I mean, I just had an obsession, but whatever the book came, it all came out of that first four pages. Know that here was a woman who was but, looking back on her life. She had regrets. She longed for love. She didn't know. I mean, she didn't know it when she had it. And then there's a. She's got a fan, and there's some kind of a secret in it. And you're not going to find out what it is until you get, you know, another 350 pages in. Mm -hmm. So that's what I knew. Um, I. I, you know, I really sort of had this idea. I mean, I knew, you know, I could have written about the sworn, a sworn sisterhood. I really wanted to write about the Lautong relationship. Um, but the other, to me, the thing that was challenging, I think, was to just think about that kind of isolation. You know, I'm out and, I mean, until the pandemic, I was out and about all the time. I travel, you know, I, I go out on book tour, I go places to do research. Um, but here's the thing, I got a very bad concussion and I wasn't allowed to drive um, for six months. And so even though I live in Los Angeles, I actually am up on a hill. I'm about a mile and a half from the, you know, from the first gas station. So it's not exactly something you really wanna walk to. <laughs> So I was really isolated. 
and um, I, I have two windows in my bedroom, but a good part of the book I wrote actually in bed and you know, with just two windows and, and really experiencing um, a kind of isolation that I've never had in my life before. And that really helped to sort of put me in that, that mindset of, of what that would mean. Wow. So you, you were re recovering and you were writing. And, uh, how and, and I'll just say one other thing that because I had a concussion, one of the things that had been affected was my, my ability to find words. And so I would say things like, um, can I have, uh, you know, it's a thing that holds tea, but I couldn't get the word for cup or I couldn't get the word for glass. I could describe what it was. And that mm -hmm. actually also really helped me with this particular book because I had to be so careful with the language um, that, you know, I was trying to con convey uh, new, sh I mean, I, it, it's actually written in rhyme. I couldn't do that. It is very simple because there are only 800 characters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I couldn't use words, I, I would hope I would never word, use a word like this, but I couldn't use, say something like the feeling was electric when they don't have electricity. I mm -hmm. remember once there was a place where I really had wanted to use the word naive. And, you know, that means childlike, but in my head, there's a lot more to it than just childlike. But there's no way that Lily and Snowflower would have ever heard this French word. You know, just no way. Mm -hmm. So my the language itself was real, had to be very simple. The sentences are very short. Again, trying to get that rhythm of Nushu without actually using it. Mm -hmm. And then and and and, and the fact that I was having trouble finding words, all of those I think really helped help the story and helped how I thought about it. Because your vocabulary, like the, writing, the actual writing of it. Yeah, you you have too big of vocabularies. You have to like uh, simplify simplify it. Um, now my question is, like, with the characters, did you grow with the characters like one chapter at a time with their age, and the plot would just come, and you didn't really pre-plan for. No, I mean there were certain things I knew. I mean you know, and a lot of it just has to do with their ages. So. You know, there's going to be the time before Lily has her feet bound. You know, I just wanted to sort of show that freedom that a little girl would have if she just has her regular feet. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, she's going to be matched in a Lao Tong relationship. So how does that work? What is it like when they first meet and they mm -hmm. go to the fair to sign the contract? Um, they're going to be in arranged marriages, you know, and at some point they're going to have to go up and get married and move into that house. Um, you know, one thing, uh, this is a story about Lily and Snowflower. Well, when, you know, back then they didn't have birth control. So when Lily moves into her husband's house, there are a lot of people there. How was I going to deal with that? Well, I gave them typhoid or, what, you know, whatever the dread disease was. And it just wiped out a bunch of people, which helped me, you know, so there, there, and then obviously I wanted to use the Taiping Rebellion. So there were certain kind of set pieces that I knew that I was going to use um, that right there, that's kind of an outline that gets you pretty far into the story. And then finally, that there's gonna be something that splits these two women apart. And right. that I didn't know what it was, I just knew it was coming. And it, and it took me a long time to sort of, sort of think that through. And, and also this idea of misunderstanding um, and the misunderstanding, and I think we can relate to this completely, you know, when you send an email or you send a text and it feels completely innocuous, but somebody else, because you're not seeing someone's expression, you're not hearing the tone of their voice. I mean, I've had emails like that where I'm like, that really hurt my feelings, <laughs> you know, like, no, or that really makes me mad, you know, whatever, but they didn't mean it in the way that I took it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I knew that there was going to be because the, you know, the language is phonetic because one girl has more education and sort of finesse than the other one. 
I knew that they're right off the bat that there's there are opportunities for misunderstanding mm-hmm. that um, that were inherent in the written language mm-hmm. and yeah. and and in, inherent in any written language, right? So um, I but I didn't know what it was going to be or how it was going to work. I just knew that it was coming. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Now zooming out, just writing in general, what inspires? This is a question from Libby Kosowski. What inspires and motivates you to write each day? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 you know, each book takes me about two years. The majority of time is spent on the research. The writing is actually the least amount of time, and then the editing is somewhere in the middle. So, you know, I I love the research. It's my favorite part of the process. If I could just spend my life researching things, I would be so happy. I mean, to me, it's like the biggest treasure hunt. I never know what I'm going to find, you know, and and hmm. and then you find certain things and it's like, oh, I've got to use that, you know, finding that that piece of writing about the Taiping Rebellion, you know, changed the novel. Um, when I was there, um, there was one point I was in this little village and you just, and it was hot, you know, trying to get pretty hot and just sitting hmm. on this kind of porch outside this house and there was a big walk embedded in into the porch huge you know huge thing and Mm -hmm. it turned out that was the house of the butcher so you know when I saw that walk that's when I knew who Snowflower would marry (laughs) you know so there's things that happen in the course of research that just change the course of the story but the actual writing um you know, I do have an outline, and I think even how I described those things earlier, you know, there's a girl who's, you know, if you see her before, she has her found, found feet, then getting her feet bound, um, you know, being a, in a, an arranged Tong relationship, being arranged in a wedding, you know, you know, those are certain, like, almost like signposts along the way mm-hmm. that I know, you know, I'll have in my little outline but it's actually when I sit down to write, that's when the real creative part happens. Mm. And it's like, I take all of that stuff that I've learned, that I've come across, but it's also really thinking about the emotions of these characters. You know, to me, they're very real people. And to just try to live in their clothes, you know, try to be in there in that room with them as they're going through their lives, you know? And, and um, to me, that's the real creative part. And, you know, sometimes it's really sad and hard. And, um, you know, when Snowflower dies, that part is, it was just so sad to me when Beautiful Moon died. I, you know, to this day, that's one of the hardest scenes I've ever written. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, sometimes I go to pretty dark places but I'm just trying to get to this kind of pure emotion in a, in a sense and trying to convey it through the writing. Share with us a little bit. I wish your... I could say like how I, what it, I don't know the process of it. I just then know the, what I'm you, you trying must, for. You must have a writer's discipline, like, you know, Tsun Shan Tsun I forgot his English name, the Japanese writer who would always get up at four o'clock and a.m. and then sit down absolutely at the desk by six and write from six to 11. Well, what, what is your daily routine like? Yeah, the- so um, I don't get up that early. <laughs> I wouldn't function very well if I did. But when I'm writing, I, I write a thousand words a day, which is just four pages. Mm. Um, but I you know, keep a little notebook where I keep track of how many words I write. But again, you know, the, the research takes the most amount of time. And I, you know, I can do that for hours and hours and hours and hours. I mean, I, because I just love it. And the editing, you know, I have more of a, a there's a point where my brain kind of turns into oatmeal. So I have a sort of more, you know, it's so concentrated. Um, so it depends on where I am in the stage of a book. 
but mm -hmm. I do work every day. I mean, I just did a little questionnaire earlier today and it was like, how many days a week do you work? And I was like, I didn't want to say seven, <laughs> but, but I do do something I would say almost every day of the week. Oh, wow. I mean, so, so I, I'd, you know, and even if it's like, um, uh, so the book that I'm working on now takes place in Wuxi. Have you been there? Um, I don't know. I, I haven't been there. I'm not going to be able to go there. But uh, there's a, a, someone in China who sent me links to something like 100 different sites that still exist from the Ming Dynasty. And so I'm, you know, every day I'm trying to you know, I have a kind of routine. I write my thousand words. I'm trying to read a chapter from um, uh, Dream of the Red Chamber. I listen to Rereading the Stone. I'm trying to look at a couple of those sites from Wuxi every day. So I don't necessarily hit all of those things every day, but I do break up the day um, mm -hmm. with those different things, you know, whether I'm um, going back through some of my research, or I've come across something new that I really need. I um, was the character in the next book that I'm working on now. She's going to travel from Wuxi to um, uh, to Beijing, mm -hmm. and it's 1468, I think, is the year. And so I was just wondering, like, how long would that take? And mm -hmm. so I was reaching out to different scholars, and was, how long would that take? And somebody mentioned to me that there was a Korean diplomat stationed on Jeju Island that I had written about in the Island of Sea Women who actually was shipwrecked off the coast of China in 1468. And he kept a diary of his journey from where he was shipwrecked to Beijing. I mean, you know, and it's like a day by day diary. So not only do I know now, you know, uh, how long it took, but what the weather was like on particular days, what he ate, what, you know, what it looked like as he was passing through different villages, how it was different in the south, and then what happened, you know, to the landscape, to the architecture, everything as it went north. And so even though he's Korean, he was actually in the exact place that I needed, you know, that I need for this new novel. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. No. Wish so, you know, just, you know, so, you know, you find something like that and then it's like, I drop everything to read it, <laughs> you know, and that, those things take time, you know, all that stuff takes time and then just sort of process what, what, what do I want to use from there? What's valuable? Um, I don't want to get too off, you know, off on a tangent. It's just to help sort of create the scene and to right. have those details. And how many hours is, is that sort of 1,000 were taking you. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You know, and, and in the end, does everything that I, you know, all the time I spent finding that book, reading that book, you know, does it end up as two lines in the story? <laughs> you know, somebody looking out the window on the Grand Canal or it, it or is there something more substantive that I can use? Wow. Um, well, anyway, we can't wait for the next book to come out from Wuxi Journey into Beijing. Uh, sadly, I think we're completely out of time. Um, thank you so much, Lisa, for, for chatting with us. Do you have any parting words for, for our audience? Actually, one of the questions is, what advice would you give to a budding writer? Uh, I think this Write is- Write a thousand words a day. Um, if you can, that's only four pages. If you can't do a thousand words, do 500. And at the end of a week, you'll have 10 pages. At the end of two weeks, you'll have a chapter. Be passionate about what you're writing. You know, this, this is not a one night stand. It's kind of like a marriage and, you know, there are going to be ups and downs, but if you're really passionate about what you're working on, that's going to see you through the, the bumpy times. And then I just want to say thank you to everybody who joined in tonight. I just so appreciate it. And I've been watching the comments and seeing wow. where you're all from. And I, you know, thank you. Just thank you thank for all you. your kind words. Yeah. And for anyone interested in following Lisa's work and announcement of other book talks, you can follow her on Instagram at Lisa C underscore writer. 
and I am at Wild China May. So anyway, thank you, Lisa, and thanks everybody for joining us. And for next month, we will be reading Serve the People, A stir Fry Journey Through China by Jianling Liu. And for those who are in Beijing, you probably know Black Sesame Kitchen. Anyway, join us then. And um, we also have a new The China Travel Podcast talking about each destination in China. Uh, you can find that on all streaming platforms. Until next event, wish you all safe and sound and read um, happy summer. All these books, read up and have fun. Thank you, Lisa. Thank hope, you so much. Hope you'll be able to make it back to China soon. Me too. Yeah. Yes. Take care, everyone.